Hi guys! In this video we're going to be looking at superconductivity, behaviour of superconductors, high temperature superconductors, the Meissner effect and we're going to finish with a summary. So we're going to start off by introducing the idea of superconductivity. We have seen that the resistance of metallic conductors increases linearly with temperature. So for example, on the y-axis here we have the resistance in kilo ohms and on the x-axis we have the temperature in degrees Celsius. And we can see here that as the temperature increases along the x-axis, the resistance also increases along the y-axis. So we can see that we have a linear relationship between the two. So that's what we've seen so far for metallic conductors. However, here we have only considered a small temperature range. So we can see on our graph we've only considered the temperature range between 0 and 80 degrees. Professor Heike Kameling Honors investigated what would happen to the resistance of a metal when cooled to much lower temperatures. So he wanted to investigate what happens when we cool below temperatures of zero degrees and go to a lot more extreme temperatures. He wanted to see how this would affect the resistance of a metal conductor. To do this, he cooled a wire made from mercury monitoring its resistance as its temperature was lowered. So here we have some mercury and this was made into a mercury wire. And then as its temperature was decreased, its resistance was monitored. So it was investigated to see how the resistance varied when the temperature was decreased to very low temperatures. To study such low temperatures, we use the Kelvin scale. So to convert from degrees into Kelvin, we do the following. So the temperature in Kelvin is going to be equal to the temperature in degrees Celsius minus 273.15. And we'll cover the Kelvin scale in a lot more detail in thermal physics later on. At this point, all we need to know is that we need to use the Kelvin scale in order to study such low temperatures, and this is how we get from degrees to Kelvin. At 4.15 Kelvin, or minus 269 degrees Celsius, so we can see how low these temperatures are, something unusual occurred. The resistance of the mercury wire dropped all the way to zero. So here we have resistance on the y-axis and we have temperature on the x-axis in Kelvin and at this particular temperature, we said 4.15 Kelvin, we can see that the resistance just dropped to zero. So what's so special about this temperature? Well, at this temperature, the mercury wire was acting as a superconductor. A superconductor is a metal which loses all of its electrical resistance below a certain critical temperature. And another term for this critical temperature is the transition temperature. So when the metal transitions from a normal conductor to a superconductor that has zero electrical resistance. The resistance drops to zero because the metal has zero resistivity below the critical temperature. So here we've got a graph of resistivity against temperature. So we've got resistivity on the y-axis in ohm meters. And again, we have temperature on the x-axis in Kelvin. And we have this critical temperature, which we're going to call T subscript C. And we can see that below this temperature, the resistance drops to zero. So below the critical temperature. This property of zero resistivity below a critical temperature is called the superconductivity of a material. 
So we saw that it was mercury that was first investigated, so therefore mercury has superconductivity. And mercury displays its superconductivity at a temperature that was lower than 4.15 Kelvin. So that was mercury's critical temperature. So the critical temperature for mercury is 4.15 Kelvin. So if the temperature of a superconductor is raised above the critical temperature, its resistivity becomes non-zero. So it loses its superconductivity. It's no longer acting as a superconductor. So again, we've got resistivity on the y-axis, temperature on the x-axis. But now we're looking at what happens above the critical temperature. So we're going above the critical temperature. And we can see above this temperature, the resistivity is no longer zero. So now we've got a non-zero resistivity. So therefore, it's lost its superconductivity. Most metals have been observed to have a superconductivity below a certain critical temperature. So, for example, aluminium has been investigated and it has been found to have a critical temperature of around 1.2 Kelvin. And another metal that's been investigated is lead. And this has been found to have a critical temperature of around 7.2 Kelvin. The critical temperature varies between different metals and are typically a few degrees above zero Kelvin, which we call absolute zero. So again, resistivity on the y-axis, temperature on the x-axis. And we can see that as the temperatures decrease more and more at the critical temperature, Tc, the resistivity drops. And typically this critical temperature is around 0 to 4 Kelvin for most metals. So now that we understand what superconductivity is, we're going to examine the behaviour of superconductors. We have seen that cooling a superconductor below its critical temperature reduces its resistance to 0. So we said for a graph of resistance against temperature, if we cool the metal to very low temperatures, at a particular temperature called its critical temperature Tc, its resistance will drop to zero. So this is when you cool it down. So we've established that at this critical temperature we have zero resistance. When a current passes through the superconducting material below its critical temperature, there will be no potential difference across it. And we can see why this is the case by looking at our equation for resistance in terms of potential difference in current. So we can write down that the potential difference V is equal to the resistance R multiplied by I. And we've just said that at the critical temperature, the resistance drops to zero ohms. So therefore, no matter what current we have, zero times this current is always going to give us zero potential difference. So we're always going to have a potential difference of zero volts below this critical temperature. So we've established that at below this critical temperature, we have zero potential difference across the superconductor. But what does this mean for its energy? Below the critical temperature, if there is zero potential difference, then no energy is lost when current flows through the superconductor. So if we examine this superconducting metal here, We have a positive end and a negative end, so a current I is going to flow through it. And we've said that below the critical temperature, we have a potential difference of zero volts across it. So this means that no energy is lost to resistance. And remember, this is because the potential difference is the electrical energy per unit charge that is converted to other forms of energy. So if we've got zero potential difference, that means none of the electrical energy is being converted into other forms of energy, which is why no energy is lost to things like resistance, because when energy is lost to resistance, it's converted from electrical energy to thermal energy very often. So this doesn't happen. So if none of this 
electrical energy is converted to other forms, this means large currents can flow through the superconductor without it getting hot. So we can now put a large current flowing through this superconductor. And because the potential difference is zero, no thermal energy is released. So the temperature remains constant, which means the metal remains cool. So we don't lose electrical energy to thermal energy. This is a very useful property with a number of applications in devices such as MRI scanners and particle accelerators. So the fact that we have superconductors that can carry very, very large currents without them getting hot can be very, very useful. But we'll go into this in more detail in the next video. So now we're going to have a look at high temperature superconductors more specifically. The critical temperature is different for each superconductor, but for most it is below 30 Kelvin or below minus 243.15 degrees Celsius. So here we have a graph of resistivity against temperature and we have two superconductors represented on this graph. Superconductor A along with superconductor B. And we can see that they both have different critical temperatures. These are their critical temperatures. And we've just said for most metals, this critical temperature is below 30 Kelvin. So very low temperatures. Some non-metallic superconductors, called ceramic superconductors, have been created with much higher critical temperatures. So, for example, this here is a ceramic superconductor, so it has a much higher critical temperature. It's got a higher Tc. So this means that these materials can conduct electricity without any resistance up to temperatures as high as 138 Kelvin, or minus 135.15 degrees Celsius. So going back to our previous graph, here we had superconductor A and B, and we said that for most metallic superconductors, their critical temperature is below 30 Kelvin. However, for this ceramic superconductor, its critical temperature is over 100 degrees higher. So its critical temperature is at 138 Kelvin. So we can see we have a higher critical temperature. And this can actually be very useful. Superconductors with critical temperatures higher than 77 Kelvin, so minus 196.15 degrees Celsius, are called high temperature superconductors. So now we're just going to look at the graph for our superconductor. So superconductors with critical temperatures above 77 Kelvin so we're talking about much higher critical temperatures than for metallic superconductors. These are what we call high temperature superconductors. But why 77 Kelvin? Well, 77 Kelvin is used as a baseline as it is the boiling point of liquid nitrogen. So liquid nitrogen boiling point is equal to 77 Kelvin. And this means that liquid nitrogen will always be at a temperature below the critical temperature of these high temperature superconductors. So we've said for our graph of superconductors, the critical temperature is above 77 Kelvin. So that's how we classify the high temperature superconductors. However, liquid nitrogen has a boiling point below this temperature. So this allows us to cool the superconductors to below their critical temperature and they can act as superconductors with no resistance. So for this reason, we can use liquid nitrogen as a coolant, maintaining the superconductivity of these high temperature superconductors. So this here in the middle is our high temperature ceramic superconductor then we put it in a container 
that's full of liquid nitrogen. So then the liquid nitrogen maintains a temperature below the superconductor's critical temperature. So this allows it to act as a superconductor with zero resistance. So finally, we're going to talk about the Meissner effect. And this is an effect that we can observe because of the superconductivity of certain materials. If we have a high temperature superconductor submerged in liquid nitrogen, then it will be below its critical temperature. So we've just seen this. So here we have our liquid nitrogen and we have our superconductor. And because it's been submerged in liquid nitrogen, its temperature is below its critical temperature. So it's acting as a superconductor now. If we drop a magnet above the superconductor, then the magnet will levitate. So here's our magnet that's been placed above the superconductor that is below its critical temperature now, so it's acting as a superconductor, and the magnet is observed to levitate. So this phenomenon is known as the Meissner effect. The Meissner effect occurs because when superconductors are cooled below their critical temperature, they repel any magnetic field around them. So this magnet here has a magnetic field around it. And now because the superconductor is below its critical temperature, it's going to repel this magnetic field of the magnet because it's come into close contact with it. So it exerts a force. And that's what causes the magnet to levitate. The repulsion acts as a force balancing the downward weight of the magnet. And so it is suspended above the superconductor. So the magnet has a weight force that acts downwards and the superconductor exerts a magnetic field repulsion force which balances out the weight force. So that's why the magnet levitates, because its forces in the vertical direction are balanced. For example, if we submerge a superconductor in liquid nitrogen and it does not cause a magnet to levitate, what is the critical temperature of the superconductor? So we've got our superconductor here and we put a magnet on top, however the magnet falls, so it doesn't levitate now. So what can this tell us about the critical temperature of the superconductor? The material is not acting as a superconductor, so it must not be below its critical temperature. So this tells us that the temperature of the superconductor must be greater than its critical temperature right now. So remember we've said that this superconductor is submerged in liquid nitrogen. So the fact that the magnet doesn't levitate and that it's not displaying its superconductive properties tells us something about its critical temperature. So its critical temperature must be below the boiling point of liquid nitrogen of 77 Kelvin. So the boiling point of liquid nitrogen is 77 Kelvin. And if the superconductor isn't displaying its superconductor properties, this tells us that its critical temperature must be less than 77 Kelvin. So it's not below its critical temperature. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're looking for an amazing A-level physics resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the snap revised smiley face and together let's make A-level physics a walk in the park.